to Kumase to gauge the mood. The morning after the <laughs> new movements, nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, Ohimin Terry and Arasta Zasari Donko and Maxwell Agbagba are our men on the ground. Uh, but Joseph Opoku Gapo has also been speaking to the chairman uh, of the appointments committee in parliament, oh. who also happens to be the second uh, deputy speaker of, uh, or the first deputy speaker mm. of parliament, Mr. Joseph Osewu. So we'll bring you that conversation right now uh, on the AM show. It's 15 minutes after eight. Please stay with us. All the ministers, by law, are agents of the president. The president campaigned on a party program, a manifesto. So what we will be seeking to find out is what is it that they do to make sure the president delivers on his promises contained in the manifesto. So all the castings should be geared towards getting the nominees to tell Ghanaians how they will assist the president to deliver on his promises. Mm. That's all. So can we expect <laughs> brutal series of questions or, well, treatment with kid gloves? I don't understand what is treatment with kid gloves. We will ask questions that will make them demonstrate <laughs> their capacity to help the president deliver on his mandate. You spoke of them being appointees of the president and them coming to serve at the will of the president. One of the controversial issues that has come up is um, one that has been raised by the Honorable Mahama Yariga, uh, the MP for Boku Central, about the position of senior minister. He thinks it's unconstitutional and that uh, it's not something that the president should have appointed the Honorable Osafu Mahfou to. Would you vet Osafu Mahfou for that position as senior minister? Yes. If you does the constitution mention minister for Greek? Or does the constitution mention minister for interior? No. The constitution does not mention any minister position with the exception of the attorney general. Even the attorney general, the constitution does not call him minister for justice. The constitution just says there shall be an attorney general who will be the legal advisor of the government, period. Beyond that, the constitution mandates the president to appoint ministers of state. The name the president chooses to give to the ministers of state or the designation and the mandate he um, invests them with, he charges them to deliver, is up to the president. That's why names of ministries keep changing. Various designations are given, determining the, the direction the president wants to go. As long as the person is not designated as being anything other than a minister of state. So, as far as I'm concerned, there is really no issue at all. So, what's probably stopped the president from naming him as such as a minister of state and, and rather chose to designate him as a senior minister? He then creates the impression that he is lifting him above other ministers, which is where Mr. Yarag is concerning. You see, in this country, there's somebody we have called chief of staff. And that person, in the past, indeed under all NDC regimes, have been made like a super minister. All ministers report to him. He is not vetted by parliament. He does not report to the parliament. He is not subject to parliamentary scrutiny. And yet we make all ministers who have been vetted and passed by parliament and subject to parliament's questioning reportable to that person. So what is this about? Then this is MPP style is to make whoever other people will report to, other people will, who a team leader report to parliament. And so for you, the president designating the Honorable Yaosafuma for a senior minister, uh, there is nothing unconstitutional about it. Mr. Herga, to quote him, makes the point that position is alien to the constitution. For you, that's not I the case. I don't understand what he means by alien. Is the Minister of Justice in the Constitution? Is the Chief of Staff in the Constitution? Is the Minister of Interior in the Constitution? Well, one of the concerns that's come up and the group involved, one Eagle group, uh, indicated that they will submit a petition like that to your office. Uh, maybe it's come through, maybe it hasn't come through yet, but uh, they make the point that when it comes to those who've been appointed to various security-sensitive positions, like 
uh, Minister for Defense, Minister for National Security, they think the vetting of these persons should be done in camera. Is that something that the committee would even consider at all, or is that workable? It is. It has been done in the past. Some members have been vetted in camera, but the committee would determine which nominee should be vetted in camera and which one. And so we'll have a pre-discussion depending on the brief. And uh, we'll be very careful. We should not judge what a person is to be done by name. Mm, Minister of Defense, what is it that is going to say that uh, is uh, so sensitive as to be done in, in camera? All ministers of defense have been vetted in public to the best of my knowledge. But when uh, a minister for national security was appointed for the first time, he was vetted in camera. We have now had another minister for national security. So the committee will discuss that. And if we find it appropriate, we will do that vetting in camera. What can we expect in terms of fairness and um, non-arbitrariness in, in, in running the vetting process? Parliament's work whether in the plenary or the committee, is regulated by standing orders. So there's no room for arbitrariness. All proceedings will be done in accordance with the rules that are approved and applied every day. So there's no room for arbitrariness. And if you're talking arbitrariness, then please count me out. It is not my style. You've known the committee for a while, but for the first time, you'll be the one you know, chairing the session. Um, you're relishing the challenge, aren't you? Hmm. No, not really is challenging about this one. <laughs> um, if if you look through the list of members who are on it, many of us have been there at least since 2009. Some were there before me, you know, so we have experience. Of course, you can expect that some level of mischief, it happens all the time. So yeah, what I should do is to be alert that nobody uses this uh, process to play any mischievous tactics, uh, but that's all. So that won't happen, you know, mischievous tactics will not happen under your watch? Uh, well, no. <laughs> uh, of course, if you are smart, you know how to frame your question such that even mischief can be covered. But I'm sure uh, there's room for a little tactic and uh, hamstring uh, approach to the issues, I'm, I'm sure. So. After the vetting processes that will be coming up on Friday, on Saturday, and then on Monday, uh, then one next, because you know that the list of ministers uh, is far more than the 13 that we've seen the timetable out for. Yeah, at the time we sat, we had only 13. So the 13 is what we programmed for. Our plan is that by the close of Tuesday, which is 24, when we do the last batch of this first set, we'll use the next day to prepare the report. And at the same time, we'll be putting out notice for the next batch so that there will be a seamless um, uh, continuity. We have a two days break. During that break, we'll be filing our report with the plenary for discussion. As soon as that goes through, we come back to start the next batch. But of course, we also expect that if people have reasons which any of the, uh, the nominees should not be um, um, approved by Parliament, they should feel free to come to us, write memoranda, or even talk to other members of, of the committee. Um, Ghanaians are fond of sitting back and expecting that somebody would know th what they also know. And when nobody knows, then they blame everybody else. So if I had known something, I'll bring it up. If you do, bring it up. Don't wait and, and then sit back and say, oh, uh, is this person is like that, is like that, but Parliament has passed in my head now. To what extent will those memoranda influence your decision? We, we, we've heard, for example, that uh, Food Sovereignty Ghana has raised issues with Dr. Koto Yosefri as Minister for Agri because they think he supports genetically modified organisms, and they think that that's a basis alone to block him becoming a minister. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So that then when some of these memoranda come to you with specific requests that don't allow this person to go through the process and become a minister, because then what happens? Because you don't agree with him? It's mm -hmm. only a matter of opinion, okay? You believe A 
is the best. I believe B is the best. And he said, because you believe A is the best and he believes B in the best, he's not fit to be a minister. Have we <laughs> do we know who, how many people else believe in A or B as the minister? I don't think. What if any such person has an issue, he could formulate a question and use any one of the members to probe. I, 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 I recall when an immediate past minister for interior was to be vetted. There's a, um, a group who are interested. I think the Small Arms and Arm, yeah, Small Arms Commission. They came to me. They brought me a lot of information relating to small arms. And so after I read all the information, all I could do was to try and fashion out one question because I was entitled to three only. And the only issue I was interested um, the small arms was not the only issue I was interested in, you know. That is using the committee to achieve some of your objectives, to get the assurances from the, uh, the nominee then, or to draw his attention to some of the issues so that when he sits in office eventually, he may pay attention to them. But it will not be a basis for saying, just because the nominee disagrees with me, his opinion is invalid, or mine is, no, that, that, that is not the appropriate way to evaluate people. So that then what kind of memoranda may end up influencing your decisions on whether to approve or disapprove a particular nominee? I think what we should look at is who is qualified to be an MP. The rules are clear. The Constitution says that you must qualify to be an MP, bef then you can qualify to be a minister. So when a person is an MP, Ordinarily, he's already qualified to be a minister. The next thing is, do I have any criminal thing that is heading? Do I have any other conduct, if had been in the public domain earlier, may have even disqualified me from being an MP? If you bring us any such memo, we will investigate to verify the truth of that matter. If it is, then we may advise the uh, 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 appointing authority that there's a person we think for A, B, C, D. Or otherwise, we challenge the person, we ask him questions. If he cannot uh, refute those allegations of fact, then the person, our committee, will consider that the person is not qualified or is not fit. Qualification is one thing, and then being fit as in your thought processes, your intellectual capacity, your integrity, as is, is known in the public. Those are different things to qualification. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you have any information that may lead the committee to come to any such conclusion, then you make the committee aware. And we use that to formulate questions and put out, um, um, and build an opinion around it. Would it ever happen that we see maybe someone being recommended as not fit for the position ever? Be be because the assumption is that parliament has virtually become a rubber stamp in courts and that when these nominations come and then, y you know, you just go through the everyday procedure and then get them out there. W would anything yes, be Do you think that the president will nominate persons without investigating their background? And if the president does investigate their background and satisfies himself that those persons are qualified and fit, just because we don't find anything wrong with the person. <laughs> you think the process is not credible and it's a rubber stamp thing? No. <laughs> um, that is our colleague there, Joseph Opoku Gako, in that interview with the first deputy speaker of parliament. Mm. And uh, but Joe the best Mice, one in a his member of parliament also for the crime. Yeah, he was speaking now in this conversation in his capacity as a chairman of the vetting committee. Uh, because we know that there because are... They're called the Appointments the Committee. The Appointments Committee. There are people appearing before that committee today. And amongst... Uh, Albert Kandapa will appear before the committee. His minister designate national security. We also have Kenneth Oforiata, who is minister designate for finance and economic planning. He's also appearing before the Appointments Committee. We have uh, minister designate senior minister Yao Osafomafo and Dominic Nituwu who is for defense. Uh, of course, we'll bring you that live when it begins uh, in Parliament.